Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We have a great set of alumni panelists here to share their experiences and answer your questions on the topic of conversation, conservation, and natural resources. We'll get started by asking each of the alumni to give a brief overview of their career path and journey, and then we'll open up for questions. And remember, any question is a fantastic question. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Elizabeth Belendez. Please tell us a few moment, you know, a few minutes about your career journey and your career path. Uh, uh, well, thank you everyone for coming. I'm, I'm honored to be invited. Um, so I am just a background before sort of how I ended up in my educational path. I am from, originally from Wisconsin and I spent my childhood um, outside um, and was always very interested in nature and um, animals and conservation in general. Um, and I and kind of in high school, I had intended to become an evolutionary biologist. Um, that was the goal when I started the biology program in uh, at U University of Wisconsin. And I realized after I took uh, bio 151 and I did my first uh, research project lit research project that perhaps that was not the direction I ultimately wanted to go. I just um, found the, the methods a little bit. I, I really didn't know what, what being an evolutionary biologist was. Um, so I kind of fell to my long term plan before evolutionary biologist, which was to be a veterinarian. Um, and I had intended to, uh, so I went through my bio program with the intention to uh, go to vet school and hoped to do so at UW uh, Madison. So uh, I in, in my, the end of my bio uh, coursework, I took the class diseases of wildlife here on campus. And it was kind of life changing. I really was like, wow, this is amazing. This, I love wildlife, I love conservation, but I discovered that I was also very interested in pathology and diseases. And this sort of seemed a way to um, combine the med veterinary medicine aspect of my interest with my wildlife and conservation um, interests. So I can, um, there are also plenty of um, faculty in that course that are wildlife biologists as well and um, uh, various microbiologists, etc. So I went to vet school with the intention to be a wildlife, bio uh, wildlife veterinarian. Um, and, and as I uh, went through my courses, I kind of, in vet school, I kind of thought about um, there are many different ways to be a veterinarian, many different specialties in veterinary medicine. And even within the wildlife veterinary medicine, there are specialties such as um, wildlife pathology, um, clinical zoo and wildlife medicine, um, or you can um, take your veterinary skills and do further graduate training and be more of a research veterinarian. So I, um, during that, the end of my um, undergraduate degree in biology and uh, throughout vet school, I had gotten interested in um, d wildlife disease through that class and I reached out to some people that had spoken the class and asked to volunteer um, in their labs. Um, that led to participation in some research projects. Um, I took a year out of a four-year veterinary program and did a um, NIH-sponsored research program for one year. Again, more research experience in this. It was um, primarily, initially primarily laboratory-based research with the, but the um, pathogens were zoonotic pathogens that came from wildlife. So it, it really still um, had that wildlife focus. And um, one of those research projects led to, during that year, was at the National Wildlife Health Center. And that actually led to my very first job right out of school, which was as a um, post-DVM postdoc um, researcher at the National Wildlife Health Center, studying a viral disease that is transmitted by rodents um, called monkeypox, and it occurs in Africa. Um, and after a few years of that, a position as a clinical veterinarian opened up at the, the same center, the National Wildlife Health Center. Um, that center is in Madison, Wisconsin, for any of you that don't know. So that's why I was able to do a lot of my 
work and research during my studies at the center. And so since 2014, I've been the clinical veterinarian there. And what that means is that I get to combine my, my clinical veterinary skills um, with the research background that I had from my research training um, before and during vet school and after vet school. Um, to help other researchers accomplish their research. And so the, the, our center, um, the, the mission is to um, help understand and um, create some solutions for managers to deal with wildlife disease. Um, and those managers are ultimately conserving those, those wildlife species. So um, it, is, it has a conservation impact, but my day-to-day um, the way that I have that impact is through um, clinical medicine for, for wildlife disease studies. So kind of combined all of the things that I found that I loved during my undergrad degree into a, I will say, uncommon career. There are not that many wildlife veterinarians, and there, but there are certainly lots of veterinarians and um, PhD biologists that do wildlife disease work. So the the vet uh, world is, I would say, not the only track into the, the study of and work in wildlife disease, but it was the one that worked well for me. So, um, yeah, and since then I've um, I've been working on very, I help PIs work on various um, diseases like avian influenza, which has both a human health and a conservation impact. Um, white nose syndrome has a very high conservation impact. That's a disease of, of insectivorous bats, and it's a fungal disease. Um, and some of the cool projects that we're doing um, that are really um, practical, I would say, are uh, we're trying to develop wild, uh, vaccines for wildlife. So we're, we, our center has developed a vaccine for plague, which is a, a bacterial disease that's um, very, um, it's very deadly to humans and animals, and it has a lot of impact on the um, recovery efforts for the endangered black-footed ferret in the western U.S. So by creating this vaccine for their prey species, the prairie dog, um, we are conserving the black-footed ferret. So that's just a good example of sort of the practical outcomes of my clinical every day. Thank you so much. I was curious what a wildlife vet was, and I had other assumptions. But your explanation gave a really great background for that. So thank you so much, and um, I love how it like all came back to you know the outdoors again and from your passion from when you were younger. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like to pass it now to Shala Warner. Um, would you please unmute and let us uh, hear a story from you on your career journey? Sure, and um, thank you for having me here today. And it was really interesting to hear from Elizabeth. Um, I work for the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. So we have veterinarians on staff and there's been some interesting things that have happened since I started there in 2015, like the avian influenza and I think bovine TB, although I'm an entomologist by background, so it's sort of, um, peripheral to what we do, um, but there's been some really interesting things with COVID, and I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about this later, but, um, you know, mink farm workers were vaccinated earlier than others because mink could spread the COVID to humans, and then there's also this connection with wildlife, such as ferrets, so that is just fascinating. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I um, also was born in Wisconsin, in Fort Atkinson, but grew up in Northern Illinois. And my dad was a game warden um, and we lived out in the country. So that gave me a lot of chance to explore the outdoors. And we had um, a bunch of abandoned railway, which was essentially remnant prairie behind the house. And so I would um, just spend a lot of time walking around there. And um, I studied biology at UW-Whitewater for my undergrad degree. Um, 
And then in trying to figure out what I wanted to do for grad school, um, I realized a couple things. One, I was one of the only people I knew that kept a nice little box of um, Ohio blue tip matches, but instead of matches, I kept insects in there <laughs> that I had collected. At, I found a Luna moth one time when I was detasseling corn at a job in Elkhorn, and I just loved insects. And um, it seemed like, um, you know, so many people were studying birds, and that was the popular thing, like ornithology. But I was um, neither a morning person or someone that liked to go out in cold weather. <laughs> so I knew that insects um, like to come out when it's warm. They're cold-blooded animals. Um, and there's not like a big fan club really at the time. So think that when I went to Whitewater, it was between 1990 and 94. So they did not have a large fan club, but there was this Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation starting up. And um, over time, um, I believe that people started to think less of insects just as pests. And now, you know, fast forward to today when there's so much interest in pollinators, um, saving honeybees and things like that, I think that, you know, we've come a long way and the Xerces Society is a pretty big organization. And so I ended up, because of that, um, going to UW-Madison for entomology for both my master's and um, PhD degrees. And for both of those research projects, uh, I studied under Ken Rafa, who just by my own dumb luck and ignorance ended up being like one of the best forest entomologists in the world. <laughs> so that was lucky for me. Um, and he gave me a lot of latitude to study something I really cared about. So for my master's, um, and this was after kind of approaching a few professors at a few different universities, and a lot of them kind of want you to just work on what they're doing. But Ken was kind of pretty open-minded. And I had found in the Burge Hall Library that the DNR wanted somebody to compare beetle biodiversity and old growth and managed forests. Um, and that ended up being just like the funnest master's project ever. Um, I got to set pitfall traps in Sylvania Wilderness, which is just over the border in Watersmeet, Michigan, um, and then compare those to our managed forests, like the American Legion Northern Highlands State Forest in Wisconsin, for example, and compare like forests that have been cut 80 years ago. And what was amazing, um, you know, whether it was clear cut or selective cut versus never cut, you could still see so many decades later the difference in beetle biodiversity. Um, and the other thing was like people don't think of Wisconsin as being like this big biodiverse place. But I mean, I was able to get like 59 different species of ground beetles from that project and hundreds of beetle species in many families and kind of learn how to identify them at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And I mean, imagine me as this girl with um, 12 giant crates of beetles on the Amtrak going there, but I did it. <laughs> um, and that was fun. And over the course of graduate school, there was this little gap in my funding between master's and PhD when I decided to do some volunteering as people do in Madison and Ken was okay with that. So I ended up um, volunteering as the co-president of the National Organization for Women. Um, I used to listen to a lot of WPR while I was identifying beetles and got interested in women's issues that way. Um, and then met my husband through this um, WYOU show called The Feminist Half Hour of Power and then ended up kind of going that other route into environmental conservation, um, working with the Sierra Club for seven years. Um, and then I think I forgot to talk about the PhD where finally the funding did come through and I worked on the introduced basswood thrips and learned about invasive forest insects that way. Um, but with the Sierra Club, I did a lot of like renewable energy work and um, 
working to um, counteract climate change, shutting down coal plants. Um, but I never forgot that entomology. And so in 2015, DATCAP, the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, um, had a job for a gypsy moth spray coordinator. And gypsy moth was one of my professor's pet insects. So he had drilled all the gypsy moth biology and management into all of his students' heads. And so I was lucky enough to get that job with DATCAP and a few months after that, one of the supervisors left and I ended up filling that position um, in September 2015. And that's where I've been ever since. And so now um, I manage a staff of 10 full time people and some seasonal LTEs. And we um, inspect and license nurseries in Wisconsin, um, Christmas tree fields, um, logs for export, things like that. And we're always looking for um, plant pests and diseases. And even though the word pest is a bit offensive to those who love insects, um, we're talking about things like gypsy moth, the emerald ash borer, um, spotted lanternfly is one that's coming at us pretty quickly, hemlock woolly adelgid, and all of these things are things that could completely change the face of our forests and our urban um, and community um, trees forever. Um, and so I just really like the work. Um, we work really closely with the DNR. A lot of our inspectors have um, plant and horticulture backgrounds. So um, we help enforce the DNRs and our 40 rule for invasive species to make sure they aren't being sold, that kind of thing. Um, and it's just a really fun job and I love it. <laughs> so that's, that's that. <laughs> Wow, thank you for that story and that journey. I also love a couple of things you especially said about how the transition of interests and how we think about pests or needs um, change your career path. So just like the honeybee and other, you know, how do we use insects to help or hinder our world? So I love, how, you know, I think about that for student career journeys and how that can always evolve as our interest as a world or society changes. Um, and I didn't know there was a whole department area that's actively monitoring that for someone who lost a lot of trees because of LR, uh, the ash borer. You know, it's really important to be vigilant and seeing how we can preserve our land around us. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I have an opening question and then I will um, maybe if uh, our student, Benjamin, if you are so brave to un, um, show your video, if not, that's completely fine. Um, we're going to have a lively conversation and learn more about both about these career journeys. Um, one thing I was thinking, I know you both went on to further your career in grad school and then um, a doctorate but I know you talked a little about the transition between undergrad and grad, but uh, what are some things you wish you've known at graduation that would have been valuable in your career, right, at the undergrad level and moving on? Was there something that if you knew more that junior, senior year, uh, um, was there something that um, you noticed later in your career that you wish you would have known to help your career journey? And I'll open it up to anyone. Um, I, I, I think I utilized this to some extent, but I could have used it more. It would just be to not be afraid to reach out to people that you aspire to be. Um, it seems really scary when you're an undergrad to reach out to a professor or a researcher outside of your institution um, or what wherever whatever career path you choose somewhere it, like look towards what you think you want to do and what you even if you're not sure um and just reach out to those people because they're not going to uh i would say you know 99 percent of people are are the worst thing they can do is give you a polite no um and maybe you'll end up finding a volunteer opportunity or a job or or even if it's just advice um, or they might know somebody that has an opportunity. 
Um, so I would say don't let fear um, or uh, I, I would say I had a little bit of like I was I saw them as superstars of their field and I was just afraid to reach out to somebody so famous in science and they're all just really people so don't be afraid of them. Yeah, and I would say I got a couple like really key pieces of advice as I was going through the journey. So like at Whitewater, I had an invertebrate zoology, zoology professor, Holly Downing, and um, she told me, and it was so cool to have a woman, you know, professor, by the way, in that field. And I was trying to decide, you know, should I even go to graduate school? What should I do with this biology degree? And she said, get your PhD because then no one else will be your boss. <laughs> and it was like this simple pithy piece of advice. Um, and she was one of the only ones telling me that, by the way, but it ended up being a really good thing. And, you know, probably if I wasn't having as much fun at Madison, I could have easily stopped at the master's and gotten a decent job, but I'm happy that I did this. And, you know, related to that, um, people will tell you, like, why are you getting your PhD? You can just be a professor. And um, I would say it is really hard to become a professor, especially at a place like UW-Madison with just a PhD. I mean, you're expected to do several postdocs. And for me, that definitely was not the right path. And so you can do other things with a PhD besides teach at a university. Um, and knowing that there are alternatives, especially if you're interested in policy or, you know, other types of like federal government agency research, there's actually a heck of a lot that you can do. Um, and so don't be afraid to take that non-traditional path. And, you know, maybe someday something besides a postdoc would be a qualifier to get into a Big Ten university like Madison. But until then, it's still fairly lonely for women, especially trying to take that path. I mean, for me, I like policy more than research, so I was happy to stop counting tiny thrips on slides. I think I would have gone blind after a while. Um, and then sort of related to what Elizabeth said, um, make sure you do something to try to zero in on what you think you want to do. Like I, I was interested in environmental conservation, but beyond that, um, I kind of looked at the Society for Conservation Biology to see what kind of jobs were actually in that field before I sunk a bunch of time and money in that area. Um, and then also um, did an internship with the DNR um, and it was a fish data collection internship. And I, again, spent a lot of time just loving the dragonflies and the water scorpions and the, you know, nothing could make it more clear that I did not want to be an ichthyologist than spending a summer as an ichthyology intern. <laughs> so do the internship um, because it'll help you focus in on your interests. I couldn't agree more with both of your recommendations. I mean, people are just people and they can just say no or just to reach out. And that's, I think, very challenging when I was an undergrad that I couldn't talk to a professor or someone in the field. So I really appreciate that. And paying attention to what you're passionate about and what really interests you, uh, because that will take you farther than just doing a job because you probably could have gotten or went on the field um, with fish, but you decided not to and look where you're at now. I um, wanted to draw a little bit to what you wrote in chat, actually, besides networking and listening by your interests, I like the idea of um, volunteering. That really, that gives, a, you know, another layer to development uh, for the career for students and undergrads and graduates. Do you want to speak a little bit more what you put in chat? Yeah, sure. I mean, one thing I'll say is that um, it's a little challenging right now with COVID. So I used to volunteer at Ulbrich just at the greeter's desk and, you know, they shut everything down last March, but there are still 
like mulching and um, way back in the day, I used to help glue the chrysalis onto the string for the Blooming Butterflies exhibit. So that's a fun, um, possibly socially distanced activity that could still be done. And once we get vaccines, um, you know, everything's opened up. But Sierra Club's um, state chapter has a monthly, now virtual, volunteer night where you might write letters to the editor or um, help them design social media posts. So just spend some time. You know, there's um, Reap Food Group. They seem to need a lot of volunteers. If you're more interested in the sustainable agriculture path, um, Troy Gardens, similar, and I think that some of those um, might even be paid. So just look around, like we're lucky to be in Madison. There's literally hundreds of organizations and a lot of them accept volunteers. And that volunteering can just be really rewarding. Like um, going back to like Elizabeth's interest, like one of my first volunteer experiences with, with a place, and maybe you've heard of them, um, Fellow Mortals Wildlife Rehabilitation and Yvonne Wallace. Um, she lives in Delavan and I used to go there when I was a student at Whitewater and just like help clean the cages and feed the you know animals like flickers i remember with like little droppers and syringes even with you know um just filled with food and um i had a pet mouse at the time which i agree it's it's on the odd side but it was easy you know um and i'd go to this fellow mortals and they kept mice in the freezer and i had to like cut them up and feed them to the raptors <laughs> which was you know it's all part of the job but um, yeah, volunteering, it just, it helped Yvonne because she was like trying to take care of 80 animals out of her house at the time. And it allowed her to like go to the grocery store and things like that. Um, and it was really helpful to me. I, it sounds like you also figured out that, that, that the, the, um, dirty icky wildlife, uh, feeding part wasn't for you. Um, I had the, I I would have had the totally different reaction to that same experience. I also volunteered at a wildlife rehab center, um, actually the Dane County Wildlife Rehab Center, in its very early years of formation, and I found all that stuff super exciting. So, it's, you know, nice. you can figure out what you love. Absolutely, and it is different for everyone. Um, and I don't know if they still do this, but the Nature Conservancy used to have like all these volunteer crews. And I remember, um, you know, it's also a good way to meet people. And so we would get together on a Sunday and um, burn invasive red cedar trees. And I remember driving home and I'm like, what's that smell? It's like, it's your hair. <laughs> So, I mean, it's like fun stuff like that you never forget and you're helping out an organization, but you're also kind of honing in on your own interests. So I think it's really, whenever you can do any kind of volunteering, it's good to do. Um, and then don't be afraid to say no. I think um, my daughter is nine and somebody, <laughs> a wise person gave me a coffee cup and it says, stop me before I volunteer again. So school comes first. Don't be afraid to say no. Um, yeah. And don't say yes all the time to all the volunteering because it can be huge. <laughs>